I read in People magazine, so it has to be true, that the good thing about wearing heels is... Hello, this is Congressional Update with Michael Capuano. I'm Sarah Fishman. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Wonderful, Sarah. How are you? I'm a little cold, but yeah. later it's going to be very hot. I think we're week. a little tired of the rainy season. Yeah, yeah. So lots to get to. Where do you want to start? Let's start very <laughs> locally with the Fairmount line yep. of the MBTA. Can you explain what that is exactly? Fairmount line is a line that we fought to get expanded. There were two stops, I think it was, a very underutilized line. Typical old commuter rail line, like we have through some of all over the place. Uh, but this one goes only through Boston. It goes from Reedville, which is the southernmost tip of Boston, into downtown. Um, and about oh, six, seven years ago, we, we worked with the state to get uh, to get it punched up so that we could have more ridership on it, added more stops. Uh, but the ridership has been lax. And then a few months ago, it came to our attention that uh, the people who ran the commuter rail, Keolis, were taking trains out of service on that line in order to provide more service to other lines, which of course is... So when did that start? When was that happening? I don't know when it started. It came to my attention, I think, give or take January, around there. Uh, we of this year? Of this year. Okay. And I don't know how long it was going on, you know, but we addressed it right away, and I give them credit. They immediately stopped that practice, um, which, of course, rendered the, the, the train has infrequent service to begin with, it's not very, and then it was unreliable infrequent service and had never been advertised within the community so the ridership was very low and knowing that the MBTA has problems and financial problems of course they're going to look to cut and I didn't want that line which had never been given a fair chance to to face an axe not that anybody was looking at it but you just never know so we decided to get that rectified as soon as we found out we got that rectified and then we decided you know what now it really deserves an opportunity to grow its ridership and we decided to provide two weeks of free ridership on that line in the hopes of um, encouraging more people to try it and use it. And so, it turns out that there's a lot of new things about that line that people didn't realize. Uh, it's really used more like a subway than it is a commuter line. Um, in that, on, a, on a, all the other commuter lines, all of them, they almost 98% of the ridership in the morning goes to either North Station or South Station. They don't get off in the middle, and it, it, there's a few extra, a few stops where they do. But they're all transferring like a Porter Square. They'll transfer to the Red Line, but they don't get off. Um, on this line, only 40, I'm sorry, 60% was going to South Station. 40% was just going from one place to another. Again, similar to the green line, the orange line, the red because line. Because it's going through the center of the because, city. Because it's going, yeah. it, well, because people work along the line. Yeah. They don't necessarily yeah. work in downtown in that line. A lot of students. Anyway, all that being said, they, they immediately did a recount uh, before they even started this and found out that there's three times more people riding the line than they had originally thought. Well, they were only counting, I read, people getting off at South, South, Station. South Station and not thinking that right. people were getting off And before. they do that for all the lines because on all the other lines, they, d they just presume this was like all the other commuter rail lines, and it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so that was al it's already a victory, and now we're in the middle right now of a two-week free, free period with the hopes of um, changing some people's commuting habits. So forgive my potential cynicism, but th this is good publicity for you. Mm -hmm. So do you think it'll have that intended effect? Don't know. It already has. By simply, f the MBTA was not going to do a recount. And by simply having them do the recount, it's already worked. Mm -hmm. We've already tripled the ridership. I mean, that was already happening. But From the when to when? Um, from one day to the next, only because it was already happening. But I mean, the, the T during the first few months. They of the did year. it before the free ridership, okay? Because they wanted right. to get started on a fresh. And they finally said, you know, maybe we should take a look at this. And they had to know how much to charge me, to be perfectly honest. And when I first thought of the idea, uh, the number was about half what I ended up paying because of based on the ridership. And so they anyway, they they had to relook at the numbers to make sure that nobody was going to get in trouble, that it was a legitimate thing. And by doing that alone, just by doing that alone, it strengthens mm -hmm. my arguments in the future to improve the service of the line. More frequent service, maybe better trains. And you know, what was it, $53,000? $53,000 from your for campaign two weeks. funds. Yep. And now I think some people looked at this scratching their heads, <laughs> saying, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but That's it's right. an unusual it thing. It is. How did you 
What made you think to do that? Um, because normally politicians would get on the phone and shake down some local businesses for the money. And here's two problems. Number one, along that particular line, there are no businesses of any significant, there's no general electric mm -hmm. on that line. They're all mom and pop stores, number one. Number two is to be perfectly honest, I don't like raising money that way. I know it's necessary on occasion and businesses who want to be a good neighbors do a lot of charitable giving. And I just thought, you know what, it's time for me to put my money where my mouth is and I decided to just do it myself. Okay, now I have to look at my notes because there are so many things. It used to be really hard to come up with things, but there's a lot of activity lately. Yeah, well, so, not much uh, of it's good. Uh, that's what some people would say. Okay, so cyber attacks. I don't think anyone likes those. So there was this big cyber attack that affected the British healthcare mm -hmm. system a lot, but it's having worldwide uh, impacts. What are... Is there anything that the U.S. isn't doing that it should be doing to prevent this kind of thing? I don't know enough about cyber, the cyber world to know the answer to that question. I think where everybody is trying to catch up, I, and in this particular case, as I understand it at the moment, the U.S. is in better position than most other countries because mm -hmm. we are better than others. It doesn't mean we're perfect. Uh, it doesn't mean we're great. It just means we have had fewer problems than other countries. Um, what more they can do? Honestly, you're asking the wrong guy. I, so, I, I can use a computer, but that's about it. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so ransomware, which is what this is called. Yeah. So they, they put something into your computer virus-like or right. mess with the code or something. And they say that they're only going to remove it if you give them money. Yep. So were people paying? I think, I think some, some are. Some I mean, I, they, did. They, 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 as I understand it, the amount of money is uh, $300, if I remember the number correctly. And you know, you got to ask yourself, is it worth the risk for $300, especially if you're a big company? Uh, what, and that's the answer is probably going to be most people will end up paying because it's it's safer than not. Number one and number two, it's, it's not a, it's not a lot of money to a big company. Obviously, at the same time, you know, when, I guess today I was reading they did it to two hundred, three hundred thousand businesses around the world, maybe more. It's a as lot of, of money. Today. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so which is makes them really pretty smart. Now, if they asked for a million dollars for each company, I think there'd be a lot more companies who would hesitate a lot a lot more I probably couldn't pay it but you know three hundred dollars in most companies would be able scary. to. scary I mean if it were it is but my understanding on this one is that there was a simple avoidance of it that many people hadn't taken what do you um, the patch putting uh, on the patch well, my on the I look I again I don't know anything more than anybody else but I get the pop-ups at home too I have Microsoft Windows as my whatever that is the thing word I processor use, where, yeah and it pops up every once in a while you have updates and I update them on a regular basis. So yeah. update your computer. This update is what your, a, an your individual can yeah. at least do. Okay, let's go on to Mr. Comey. James Comey has been fired as FBI director yeah. um, by President Trump. So first a trivia question. Hmm. When, why, and by whom was the FBI founded? When, give or take, somewhere in the 30s, why to combat uh, criminal activities? Uh, Nate, what they saw then is nationwide criminal activities. By whom? I don't know. I'd guess Hoover maybe, but that's just a Survey guess. Survey says you got two of the three wrong. Okay. okay. I'm not, like, so it was established uh, in 1908. Oh, that early? Okay. Yes, by Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. In part to monitor the activities of anarchists who were believed to have been involved in McKinley's assassination in 1901. Ah, okay. And also to be, as you said, a sort of national police force. Yeah. I think Teddy Roosevelt's first um, elected position or public servant position was as um, police commissioner That's right. of New York City. That's right. So it's, it kind of stands to reason that he would be thinking yeah, those I guess. terms. But, but it didn't come to prominence until the, uh, till the, depre uh, till the Depression and the uh, um, bootlegging era. That's yeah. when it came to prominence. Yeah. Apparently he liked when he was police commissioner going into bars in disguise to see if they were uh, complying with liquor laws. <laughs> so anyway. Thank you, Doris Kearns Goodwin, for that. Um, all right, so Mr. Comey, he was fired. First of all, are you surprised he was fired? Um, I was surprised he was fired when he was fired. Had he been fired early on in the Trump administration, by early on within the first couple of weeks, it wouldn't have been shocking to me. So it's surprising now because of the because ongoing... of the way because of exactly what's happening. I mean, most of America thinks that he was fired because he's investigating the Trump administration, um, not just for some generic reason. And especially when the Trump administration says we're firing him because of what he did to Hillary Clinton, that's nobody believes that. So at first he said he was being fired because that was the recommendation. Yes. But then he said he asked. But the recommendation for that. was based on him. his actions during the Hillary Clinton during the campaign. Right. 
But then he said it was completely his idea anyway. Yeah, he was going to do it anyway. So someone said that's obstruction of justice. If Potentially. You're so can you explain that? Um, well, as I understand it, uh, again, if, if, if there is a legitimate investigation going on, you, the law says you have to cooperate. I mean, you, don't have, you have a right to So the investigation in this case was of? The Trump administration and the Trump campaign to see if anybody had any, uh, had any inappropriate relationships with the Russian Russia, Federation yes. who, had tried, who had broken our laws trying to hack the, uh, the election. And of course, he turns it into, well, they didn't change the outcome. I'm one of the guys that thinks, well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. That's not the point. It's like, you know, whether you robbed the bank or not, it's not the point. But you, you still you, robbed you the bank. Broke, you broke in. Yeah. If you didn't walk out with any money, you still broke the law. Um, and that's clear with the, from, from what I know and from what so all So is of this me, hard and fast? Because nobody says alleged Russian activity. Everyone everybody, says... Everybody, again, way beyond my capacity. What but is actually, the I sat evidence down, that it's irrefutable? I, 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 you'll have to ask somebody who's in the tech... This is all cybersecurity stuff. Right. Again, we'll go right back to the very first thing. I can only tell you that what I did is, I, since I don't know much about it, um, I went to a, a local company that is internationally known in that era, in that realm, Akamai. In your district? So. Yeah, Akamai down in Cambridge. Yeah. They, that's what they do. They right. understand this. And I had them walk me through how you can determine, uh, can you determine who did a crime and how it was done. And basically they said you usually can. You can't necessarily guarantee that it was Sarah Fishman, but what you can do is if, if Sarah Fishman is a known hacker, which many of these people are, you know, they know how she does these things. She has a, a digital signature. Right. Way beyond my capacity, but they said you can pretty much determine who's doing it and how it's done based on previous activity. You don't just walk in and hack the United States government. You know, you start out by hacking, you know, mom and pop stores and work your way up. And so therefore, you, you, there aren't many people who can do this. You have a cyber signature. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and honestly, I, I was very impressed with the conversation because I was afraid I was gonna get technological gobbledygook that I couldn't understand. The guys that I met with, they were wonderful. They spoke in plain English for a simpleton like myself. And I, I won't say I understood it, but I had a much better feeling that, yes, when 16 US governmental agencies come out and say, we know the Russian government did this, um, I now feel comfortable that they know what they're talking about and they're right. Somewhat remarkable for all 16 to agree with each it, other. It's stunning. If, yeah. if they were arguing yeah. amongst themselves, you could argue it, but they're, they're all of the same mind. And that mind, I now feel comfortable thinking, is based on facts and not just based on you know, follow the leader. So um, what's going to happen now? Are there ongoing investigations? Who's doing an investigation? Is there, there are. More the than House and the one? Senate are both doing investigations, and the FBI is doing an investigation. Uh, the House and the Senate investigations, they may or may not come to conclusion, but everybody knows what's going on in Washington. We have partisanship that's never been seen before. Um, it could end up in the right thing, but a lot of people are concerned that it won't, uh, that it will become another partisan argument between the Democrats and the Republicans. We'll see. It's too early to tell. Um, so is the there FBI a need was for an, do one. And in, the, in, independent investigation? Not right now, there's not. It's the FBI was doing it, and the, the FBI has a good reputation. They've had their bumps, obviously, around here in Boston. Most people are familiar with their, uh, their failings on occasion. But overall, they're considered a pretty legitimate agency that does legitimate work. Um, and this was one of those cases that they were, they're doing a full-blown investigation. And people were hoping they'd be the ones who could be trusted as uh, doing an independent one. Uh, now that Mr. Comey's been fired, I think many people, including myself, have doubts almost no matter who they appoint um, is going to be suspect uh, as to whether they will. So, they will. in an effort to broaden my uh, diversity of what I read, I was reading Breitbart News online, mm -hmm. and there was an article there saying that um, special counsels, which are are somewhat like or are the same as independent investigations, are illegal? What is that? A They're not illegal. They, 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 a there was a law passed after Watergate that you know, set out how you get them and how they're appointed, and uh, that law was allowed to lapse by the, not this Congress, but a previous Congress run by Republicans. It was allowed to lapse. So right now there is no law that sets it forth. They're not prohibited. Um, the, the Attorney General could come in and do one. The FBI could come in and do one. The Congress could do one. They could set so up their own. So it's just that the authority under which they were done before no longer exists? Uh, the, the specificity. The authority okay. exists, but the specificity. The law set out how you do it and how long they last and what their powers are. Now there'd be a more up to the person that appoints them. And even then, um, again, depending, I mean, for the sake of discussion, in theory, Attorney General Sessions could appoint one, um, but if he appointed his brother, um, they would, it would be suspect. So therefore, it, the law is not there, and the appointment 
can be done, but then the question is how independent will they actually be? And right now they're not being done. So, I mean, there's, there's not an argument to be okay. had Okay, That's good. I didn't know that. That's a good explanation. Okay, let's be a little internationally focused now. So Emmanuel Macron won the presidential election in France. Very He's, good French accent. Uh, that's the extent of it. <laughs> um, the, he's only 39. Um, were you surprised that he won over the no. more extreme um, right re candidate? Relieved is more like it. I mean, I think everybody expected him to win, but uh, expectations come to fruition is relief. So why do you think we had the result we did with our presidential election and they had the result they did with their presidential election, especially <laughs> given, do you know what the unemployment rate is nationally here? Something like 4%. It's like 4 or 5%. And you know what it is in France? It's like 40%. Mm, that's not that's that's not right. Uh, but, it might be it might be impossible. Well, even if it, even if it's a little off, yeah. the point is, they have unemployment. They've had terrorist attacks. Yes. They've had immigration issues. They've had all sorts of you know. So how come? It, well, I think it, I, is it instructive all, at all that the, these election results I don't know. I'll leave that to different. the sociologist to to figure it out. But I, look, European nations have lived different lives and have had different experiences than the America. I mean, Americans have. 3,000 miles of ocean on both sides of us. So we have a different sense of security uh, than does Europe, who had to live through the, the World, World War II. War II yeah. uh, and France, uh, not just World War II, but France also went through the decolonialization aspects in Algeria and the rest of Africa that brought terrorism to their shores, to their homeland, many, many years before us, uh, but after World War II. So this is not new to them. I, I think that they don't necessarily freak out as much as, as American citizens do. Uh, number one. Number two is, is I, I think, I'd like to think that, um, again, they went through the Adolf Hitler years. They know what extremism can do in a more first-term basis than we have. You know, the closest we came was McCarthyism and that he was never president. So um, had he become president, I'd like to think we would have avoided what we just went through. Um, but at the same time, I also think that Trump's election probably woke up a lot of the world and said, oh my God, um, these uh, faux populist types of people can get elected and this is not what we want. So I think all that play came into play. And plus, Mar Marin Le Pen, the opponent, um, she was not an unknown quantity. Uh, you know, she, and, and her movement is not unknown. It's been around for a while. So you could argue that Trump is a phenomenon, of a one-time phenomenon. We'll find out what's one time. But a one-time phenomenon, you couldn't make that argument with uh, Marin Le Pen. Hmm. Those are interesting, yeah. Interesting analysis. OK, let's go back to domestic. So the budget that just passed. Um, that funds the federal government through the end of September, the end of the fiscal year. Right. So that passed the House by a fairly large margin. You voted for it? I don't remember. I think everyone I think I voted, in the... I think I voted for it. Yeah, everyone in the Massachusetts yeah, delegation Yeah, hesitantly, but for it. did it. Pardon? Hesitantly, but I think so I did, So why yes. did you vote for it? Um, because you can't shut the government down. I mean, with all, in, in, on number one, number two is we are the minority, and number three, I think as the minority, I think you have to look in the mirror on occasion and say, is this the best we're going to do? And I think in this particular instance, uh, with the Congress being run by Republicans and the White House by Republicans and them being in such disarray, uh, I have to think, that honestly, this was the best we were going to do so, at this and point there was, in time. And there was no specific funding for the wall. Yeah, but that's, that's that one of many... That had nothing to do with your vote. Well, it had something to do. It's one of okay. a thousand issues. I mean, it's yeah. the one that some people hung their hat on. I, um, If he had had some funding for the wall in there and still the rest of it, I don't know how people would have voted, including How would me. you have voted? I don't know. It depends how much funding. And it depends where the funding came from. If so he... there's still, get this, this is not English, um, $1.1 <laughs> billion in the budget for supplemental spending yeah. for... Border, border security, security technologies and existing infrastructure yeah. improvements yeah um, what is that uh, well that's a good question uh, it, it as as everybody understands it to be it's uh, in, there are security barriers along the along the border now it's not a wide open border there's a lot of fencing not walls but there are fencing there are other security aspects there are there are drones there are uh, um, in, in ground uh, surveillance systems. Uh, so it's not just this open border that people can walk across you know, willy-nilly. Um, and and I, my, everybody believes that to be ways to improve the current um, border, number one, uh, both with a physical structure, if they want to expand the fence a little bit, or fix where the fence might have some, you know, they holes. fell down or holes, whatever yeah. it might be. That, any, any structure requires maintenance. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two, to hire more border patrol people, to hire maybe buy more drones, those kinds of things. Um, and and I, it's kind of, I mean, it's not what I, it's not my priority. But at the same time, it's awfully hard to argue against a secure border, not just in the south. I would actually say the north as well and on the shores. So I am in Canada, not opposed to, to a strong border. Do we look at passports going in and out of Canada? Yes. I don't think we always did, though. No, we didn't. But uh, yeah. since 9-11, you better have a passport. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not getting into Canada. Yeah, well, that, Or, yeah. more importantly, you're not getting back from Canada. Yeah. You'll be yeah. calling my office. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So both, same question for two different things. Status of health care legislation and status of the still somewhat sketchy tax plan. Tax plan is nowhere yet because, as you just said, that's all it is, is a sketchy outline with, with no details whatsoever. So the, who knows where the tax plan is? Nobody expects it to happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, maybe the fall at the earliest. But would there potentially be this humongous cut in... Sure. To I businesses. Mean, they're, they're potentially anything, yes. You know what happened in Kansas? They they bottomed out, they zeroed out the the tax for businesses, and so they all switched their income to be business income rather than wages and very much lowered the, yes. the budget revenue and they have a real budget and now they have now. like a court order that the schools aren't being funded properly or something like that. Yes, it's a mess. Uh, they live. Kansas is being governed by a bunch of philosophical zealots, and everybody knows it. Um, and that's a potential of what if other states want to go that way. That's their prerogative. But isn't that sort of a? Should that be taken as a sign of what the federal government should? Or I, I think do? it should be taken as a sign of what you what happens. What are the consequences you, of doing certain things? I mean, yeah. Look, I, you know, I'm a former tax lawyer. My wife's a CPA. There's nothing wrong with avoiding taxes legally by, you know, having appropriate deductions or, you know, claiming your income a different way as long as it's legal. Um, it, it's nothing wrong with that. And people do it. Everybody does it. And it should be expected when you change the tax law that people are going to try to lower their taxes. That's normal. Do That's you think human. it should be simpler? I mean... Oh, God, yes. We've tried to do that. Ninety percent of us should be able to file our taxes on an index card. Yeah. Um, but the problem when you do that, you'd have to get rid of half the deductions. And then some people would say, oh, my God, my deductions. Well, if you get rid of half those deductions, you could lower your taxes. But it, it's a very – that's why massive ta you know, – broad-based tax reform is very difficult to do. And when you, when you hear tax simplification, uh, unless you're a college kid, be very suspect uh, because you know, simplification – almost never happens. They usually just add another form that most people, most middle income people will probably not be able to use. It's good for young people who may only have limited income, uh, don't have a lot of investments, don't have a home, you know, whatever it might mm -hmm. be, all the typical things that may not have any kids. That, that, that's easy to simplify. Right. But once you add a home, once you add child care, once you add health care, all the other things that you gather as you grow older, um, you can't simplify it. I mean, you can, but it's unlikely to be able to be done in a political world. So that's number one. As far as the health care bill goes, it's on the Senate. Uh, the House passed this outrageous bill as far as I'm concerned. Barely. Uh, barely. Um, they, 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 but anybody who votes, who, who, who bets against an incumbent president and a party, uh, a party leadership that is in total control of the House and the Senate and the White House, it's a, it's a fool's bet. Um, you know, the president and, and others have enough levers to be able to pull to make enough people vote the way they want to vote normally. Not always, but normally. It took time. They had to go through a bunch of fits and starts, but it was, it was always going to happen. Now, whether they can do it in the Senate is a different story because the Senate does not stand, the whole Senate doesn't stand for election every two years. It's only a third of the Senate. And... Uh, so the other two-thirds can look them in the eye and say, you know, you're, I don't really have to worry about this for four years or six years, whoever, depending who they are. So it's, it's a different story. The Senate... And they also said they, they might even just start from scratch. They, they will not, start from scratch. There's yeah. no way they're going to use this bill. If this bill were to pass tomorrow, there would be, it would be chaos throughout the country. And anybody who knows anything about health care would agree with that. Okay. All righty. Um, so I want to talk about transparency and websites. So if you go to the EPA website, oh, so um, where you go with this? Okay. Uh, there are, it says that there's a back to basics agenda yeah. based on the three E's, which are environment, protect it, economy, don't overregulate it, and engagement with state and other partners. And if you look at 
the EPA website that existed before the Trump administration. It said that its mission was to protect human health, which came first, and the environment. It says nothing about the other E's. Right. So I'm not sure what my question is here, <laughs> but it, it's, it's more than just a, an omission. There's a whole mission no, shift. No, no, it's not an omission. It's an intentional action, and not just the EPA, but starting with the EPA. But it's, it, it is so bald-faced. Yeah, there, I mean, so. but no one should be surprised that the Trump administration is going to do everything it can to gut the EPA from the inside. Um, you know, they're not. You have to give. You have to give the right wing Republicans credit. They have learned from past mistakes. When they come after things like the EPA, things like Social Security and Medicare and, and education, all the other things that they hate the government doing, when they come after them and through the front door, they lose every single time. People want clean air and clean water. They won't be doing that this time. They'll be doing exactly what you're talking about. They'll go into places like the EPA and they'll gut it out. They will be a I mean, shell you, of an EPA. You've said this before. Yes. So is there anything, I mean, this is a, maybe focusing on the wrong thing because it's so small, but is there anything that can be done like electronically at least to tell people that this has changed? For instance, apparently the city of Chicago noticed this change mm -hmm. and apparently they had somehow captured the old website. So they took the old website information, put it on the city of Chicago's website, so then people could see, that's, you know. That's it, fine, but, it, it, but that again. Do you you it's, don't think the, that does anything? No, it doesn't hurt, but the EPA is more than a website. I mean, the EPA is enforcement of, of existing laws and trying to work with people to get them to clean the air and the water that they pollute. I guess my question is. And if is, they're not doing that, what difference does it make what's on the website? So for me, people, it's not the website is indicative. It is not the problem mm -hmm. of itself. Right. It is indicative of the other things you're going to be doing, which are much more substantive and much more dangerous. I guess my, my point is, if people can see something like that, because that's so visibly different a change, then that's maybe a rallying point for activism or for protest or I, I don't know. Maybe, what. I don't know. I mean, you don't think most people who care about the EPA probably didn't vote for Donald Trump to begin with. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it's not just the EPA. The same thing is going to happen and yeah. to a smaller extent to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, public education. <clears throat> he intentionally appointed a secretary of education who has publicly stated on numerous occasions so that she doesn't think the federal government has a role in education, which is why she got booed and hissed yes. at and the one commencement that she, she gave. She gave, yeah. yeah and it's, it, so no one should be surprised that they're going to, I mean, so they didn't get rid of the Department of Education, but they appointed Genghis Khan to run it. And, and that's what they, she's going to do. She is going to slowly but surely, you know, cut that, that department out from the inside. There will be a Department of Education, but only on the front, nothing behind yeah. it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you didn't want good news, did you? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so we don't have very much time left. I'm just curious what you think about this. You know how they've uh, there was this demonstration in Charlottesville, Virginia, with people holding f fiery torches, um, resisting the, remove the movement, uh, the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. Did you see that? I saw. I thought one? there was New Orleans, but yeah, um, I, saw, I saw. I saw. Yeah, there was one in Charlottesville, and you know, it looks like a Klan rally. It looks horrible. Yeah. It is horrible. Right. So, what should be done with these monuments? <clears throat> do you have any? On no, I have no idea what they're going to do with them. Uh, I haven't really should followed. Should they be put that. in museums? Should they be mothballed? Should they? I don't know. I mean, I don't. Curious what you look, thought. To me, it's long overdue. I mean, no other country in the world ever erected monuments to people that uh, revolted against the government and lost. You know, you don't. See, if that were the case, there'd be monuments all over England. They had a revolt every couple of years in the <laughs> Middle Ages, uh, and France and other places. Uh, Russia the same way. Nobody else does that. We have allowed it to happen over 100 years to people that normally should have been jailed and prosecuted for And Jefferson Davis was uh, mm -hmm. prosecuted because he was the president of the Confederacy. You know, they, they committed treason. And I don't have a real problem with, with you know, removing the statute. The statute never should have been allowed in the first place. Um, but it was in rectifying an old mistake. It's never too late to correct it, and I think now is it. Now, what they do with the statutes... I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, you're not looking to vilify those individuals any more than they have already been vilified over the last hundred years, which hasn't been enough, in my opinion, but so be it. Um, I'm not really worried what they do with the statues. If they place them in a museum, if they melt them down for, you know, a new boat, I don't know. All right. Well, on that interesting 
uh, note of what could happen next. <laughs> this has been Congressional Update with Michael Capuano. Have a nice day.